SpaceX released some cool new angles of Starship's landing burn and splashdown from Flight 10. Along with explanations from Elon Musk himself, we now have a clearer look at what happened during the latest Starship upper stage landing. So let's dive in and explore some of the secrets that have been unraveled. First off, thanks to Elon Musk, we now know why Starship looked so unusual during its latest splashdown. As seen in the post-landing images, the heat shield side of Starship had turned a striking orange color, very different from the familiar black ceramic tiles we're used to seeing. Initially, many speculated that this discoloration was due to a catastrophic failure, perhaps a large number of tiles detached during descent, exposing the underlying material to intense heat. However, Elon clarified that the reddish-orange areas were actually due to experimental metallic tiles that oxidized during re-entry. Metal oxidizes fast at Mach 25. The white patches, on the other hand, were from areas where tiles were deliberately removed and replaced with insulation for testing. Looking closely at the splashdown images, you can see obvious white streaks and distinct white patches along the center line of the heat shield, surrounded by the oxidized orange. Interestingly, these spots match up with pre-launch photos where some tiles were visibly missing. Those were test zones for evaluating alternative heat shield materials. So one mystery solved. The good news is that the vast majority of heat shield tiles stayed intact, which means SpaceX's latest upgrades are working well. Elon confirmed this himself. But this flight also pointed out some issues with the new metal shield that SpaceX is testing. These metallic tiles are designed to flow liquid methane through tiny holes in the outer surface, allowing the shield to sweat and release heat. This method would help prevent the steel from reaching melting temperatures during re-entry. I personally think this is a promising concept. In theory, it could lead to a more robust, low-maintenance thermal protection system, TPS, compared to fragile ceramic tiles. But being an active system, it naturally comes with more complexity and risk than a passive one. You need to carefully distribute coolant in the right amounts across the entire surface, and that distribution would vary depending on re-entry conditions. Unlike ceramic tiles, which you can just bolt on, this kind of system requires a full redesign of the ship's structure to support it, and that adds mass and engineering challenges. Realistically, SpaceX should probably stick to experimenting with this concept for now. It makes more sense to wait until Starship's overall design is finalized before integrating such a system into a future version focused specifically on that technology. Now, as much as I want to keep talking about the Starship heat shield, there's still so much more to cover about the Flight 10 landing, like the aft flap, for example. It was one of the most heavily damaged parts during the flight, but also one of the key components that kept the ship from getting out of control all the way to the end. Around T plus 47 minutes, we saw a large flash, followed by a section of the skirt being destroyed. Debris was scattered everywhere, and the flap was also visibly damaged. In the new SpaceX footage, if you look closely at the bottom of the stage, you can see exactly where the destruction happened around the engine skirt. However, some people pointed out that one of the flap hinges already looked damaged before that incident. To highlight that observation, right before engine relight, there's a noticeable bump in the silhouette at the upper left, something that wasn't there just before Sika. And once the relight starts, you can actually see what looks like sheets of metal shedding from that same area. There's a theory going around that locks vent lines behind the flaps may have caused the issue. It's a small detail, but one that I hope SpaceX shares more info about in the future. Anyway, throughout re-entry, we watched as plasma and heat slowly ate away at the bottom corners. Once a weak point is exposed and part of the heat shielding is gone, that area becomes even more vulnerable. Luckily, even though the fins were seriously degraded, they're anchored by hinges much further forward. So while the damage looked bad, the flap structure remained sound, and the onboard systems were still able to compensate and maintain control of the spacecraft. Another cool thing about the landing is that despite all the chaos during re-entry, it's amazing how accurately the ship was still able to land. Elon said the landing was accurate to within 3 meters, or approximately 10 feet, of the target position. And hey look, a rainbow! When a big hot object like a rocket splashes down into the ocean, it generates intense heat that instantly turns water into steam, creating a cloud of tiny water droplets in the air. If there's a strong light source, like sunlight or flames from the rocket, that light can pass through the droplets, bending and reflecting inside them. This process, known as refraction and dispersion, creates a rainbow. It's the same effect that causes rainbows after a rainstorm, light interacting with water droplets at just the right angle. Pretty cool to see. 
This landing of Starship, though not perfect, was still an incredible moment and something SpaceX has been working toward for a long time. But I think in this particular flight, the Super Heavy booster also deserves some recognition. One of the three center engines typically used for the final landing was intentionally disabled as part of a test to see if a backup engine from the middle ring could compensate. The booster then transitioned to just two center engines for the final landing phase, even performing a full hover above the ocean surface before shutting down and dropping into the gulf. SpaceX did let it hit the water pretty hard in the end, but that was likely intentional. They probably didn't want a big chunk of the booster left behind that they'd have to go recover. Unlike earlier boosters, like B-13 or B-16, this one had already successfully completed all of its mission objectives. So, what does the success of Flight 10 mean for the future of the Starship program? When SpaceX CEO Elon Musk addressed employees in South Texas in late May, reigniting his long-term vision of making humanity multiplanetary, he reiterated his overarching goal. Progress is measured by the timeline to establishing a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. That mission has a ticking clock. The next optimal Mars transfer window, when the planet's position shortens travel time for spacecraft, arrives in late 2026. According to Musk's roadmap, SpaceX is aiming to send up to five uncrewed Starship missions to Mars during that window, each carrying cargo. It's an ambitious goal, especially for a vehicle that has yet to complete an orbital mission. Meanwhile, back on the moon, NASA is depending on Starship for its own high-stakes mission. SpaceX is under contract to deliver a version of Starship that will serve as the human landing system for NASA's Artemis III mission, currently targeted for mid-2027. That mission would return American astronauts to the lunar surface for the first time in over 50 years. At the heart of the Artemis program is a geopolitical race. NASA and U.S. lawmakers are increasingly wary of China's rapid progress in space exploration. There's growing concern in Washington that China could beat the U.S. back to the moon and attempt to claim priority access to strategic lunar resources, or even establish exclusion zones. NASA Administrator Sean Duffy ordered the agency to accelerate efforts to deploy a nuclear power plant on the moon, warning that if another country gets there first, it could potentially declare a keep-out zone. But none of these ambitions, Mars or Moon, is possible without Starship proving it can perform. That's why Flight 10's mostly successful test was met with optimism and praise from across the space community. After the launch, Duffy posted on X, Congratulations to SpaceX on its Starship test. Flight 10's success paves the way for the Starship human landing system that will bring American astronauts back to the Moon on Artemis III. This is a great day for NASA and our commercial space partners. Looking ahead, one more Starship Block 2 vehicle remains, and it's expected to fly on Flight Test 11. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk is known for setting ambitious and often optimistic timelines for the company. In May, he indicated a desire to significantly ramp up launch frequency. Launch cadence for next three flights will be faster, at approximately one every three to four weeks, Musk posted in May. If that schedule holds, Flight 11 could happen by late September. That timeline may actually be feasible. Since Flight 10 largely went according to plan, federal regulators are unlikely to require a formal mishap investigation. Nor is the FAA expected to demand the same level of documentation SpaceX had to submit following the previous three launches. That clears the path for a quicker turnaround. SpaceX hasn't released a detailed flight profile for the next mission, but it will be the final launch of a Block 2 Starship, an interim design before transitioning to the larger and more advanced Block 3 vehicle, which will feature upgraded Raptor engines and other improvements. Given that, Flight 11 is likely to remain suborbital. The focus may be on demonstrating Raptor performance in space and testing further heat shield enhancements. SpaceX could also attempt a steeper re-entry angle to push the heat shield harder than in past tests. As for catching the vehicle with the launch tower's Mechazilla arms, that's probably not on the agenda yet. While Ship 37 successfully splashed down on Flight 10, it faced several close calls. SpaceX may first aim to perfect soft landings with minimal anomalies before taking the risk of attempting a catch. And to wrap things up, let's talk about that other stunning Starship landing footage. Elon Musk shared some jaw-dropping video of Ship 31 softly splashing down in the Indian Ocean. The footage, incredibly steady and clear despite being captured in the middle of the ocean, came from a camera bolted to a Starlink terminal sitting in what Musk jokingly described as a kiddie pool. As he posted, this looks fake, but it's real. Ship 31 had flown with Booster 13 during Flight Test 6, and despite parts of its heat shield being removed prior to launch, 
leading to visible discoloration and warping on re-entry, the vehicle touched down almost perfectly on target. Remarkably, much of the structure remained intact. The only obvious damage appeared to be a bent vacuum Raptor nozzle, which is relatively minor considering the intense conditions of atmospheric re-entry and ocean splashdown. This flight was more than just visually impressive, it was also historic. Ship 31 was the last V-1 starship to fly. Its sibling, Ship 32, was completed but never launched and has since been scrapped. With that, Ship 31 closes the chapter on the original starship design, paving the way for the upcoming Block 2 and Block 3 variants. But how did SpaceX manage to film such clear, stable footage in the middle of the ocean, thousands of miles from land? A company called MarkSetBot makes robotic buoys used to mark sailboat racecourses. Controlled by an app, they can hold position using GPS, staying in one spot even in rough conditions. Starship used one of these racing markers to stay put and record the landing. Why not just use a regular buoy with an anchor? Because the ocean is about five miles deep at that location. Anchoring wouldn't work. And that kiddie pool Elon mentioned? It's not actually small. These are buoys typically used in competitive sailing events. They can range in price from around $4,000 for the basic models, the kind everyone hates, to as much as $40,000 for the top tier versions used in the America's Cup. The one used here was a mid-range model, likely priced around $8,000 to $12,000. It has four propellers, can handle winds up to 30 knots, and maintains positional accuracy within one meter in winds up to 15 knots. With 30 knot winds, the error margin can increase to around 3 meters. The cheaper ones only have a single motor and struggle to hold position in swells and wind. The top tier models, which are basically mini catamarans with 8 propellers, can maintain under 50 centimeters of error even in 35 knot winds and are able to reposition on the fly.